I love teaching the Bible because every time I teach the Bible, I get to study the Bible and then I get to know more about God than I knew before. You know, there's no end to Bible study because God is infinite. And so I love, I love getting myself into, the, into God's word, but it's not just a, a head game because unless we live it out, then we're wasting our time. You know, it's, it's how we live our lives that, that matters. And when we were considering um, heroes of, of the faith from the Old Testament, we're seeing how they lived their lives. Not what they believed, but, but how they actually lived. Now, I know it's also Independence Day today. So we're celebrating what happened almost 250 years ago. Well, you are. It's, it doesn't mean a lot, as a lot to me. I come from the South. Um, that's the deep South, New Zealand. Um, but we still respect um, everything that this stands for. And, and um, even, even though I had some fundamental misconceptions, I look back at, at the heroes of, of the uh, Declaration of Independence, like, like um, George Washington. My parents, when I was young, told me about George Washington. They, they said that he chopped down a cherry tree. And, um, and when his father asked who had done it, he confessed and, and said, I did it. I chopped down the cherry tree. Little did I know that my parents lied to me. They lied to me to tell me the importance of telling the truth. There was no cherry tree, right? It's a great story, part of the parental myths. Did that happen for you? No, you, you, you knew already. Okay. Anyway. But I still like George Washington. He's, a, he's an amazing man, as they were. But we're going back much further than 250 years. We're going back two and a half thousand years. What on earth can people who lived two and a half thousand years ago teach us? How to use the internet? How to handle smartphones? How to drive a car? I mean, their lives are just so totally different from ours that it's just sort of like a, impossible. What, what can they teach us? And the answer is that they're humans. We're all humans. We all have certain needs as, as human beings. The need to be loved. You know, that's a, that's a fundamental human need. How to find God. You know, we look at these heroes and see, well, how do they manage to find God in the midst of their own challenges? So, yeah, we can learn from these Old Testament heroes. The pursuit of God never ends. God is infinite. So as finite beings, do you think, how long do you think it's going to take us to grasp the infinite? I haven't got there yet, so the more I read, the more I study, the more I realize how little I know. But the journey is wonderful, and that's what we're invited to. It's a life of faith to explore, to, to find out what happened. I want to be a great lover of God. I want to be a lover of people. That's a lifelong pursuit, and I'm still working on it. How can we, how can we have great relationships? There's so many broken relationships in this world, and, and how can we put the balance right? How can we model Healthy relationships. That's my hero of the faith today. Somebody who teaches us how to do relationships. The importance of, of healthy relationships. His name is Mordecai. And you'll find the story of Mordecai in the book of Esther. Most of you have probably heard a little bit about Esther the young Jewish girl who grew up to be the queen of, of the Persian Empire. She was a great woman, and we hear a lot of sermons preached about her, but behind her was somebody called Mordecai. Who was Mordecai? Mordecai was her cousin. Mordecai was older than, than Esther. Esther's parents died, and Mordecai adopted her and raised her as his own daughter. So he was the one who who was there for her and, 
and was able then to sort of direct her life and, and set her free to become the person that God designed her to be. Without Mordecai, there would have been no Esther. It's a great story. And here's the challenge. We can never be all that God intends us to be on our own. We need other people. That sounds a bit ironic since it's Independence Day. Do you really want to be independent of everybody? The problem was that for the, for the American people, they needed to be independent of the British because the British were exploiting them. It was, a, it was a dysfunctional, unhealthy relationship. They needed to be free of that so that they could become a great nation, a united states. So when we're talking about Independence Day, don't, don't for a moment think that we don't need relationships. We do. We all do. We need relationships as much as we need oxygen and food. You may think that's an overstatement, but it's not. Modern neuroscience um, confirms something that Mordecai modeled two and a half thousand years ago, that we need relationships to thrive. We'll talk more about that as we go through the story. Okay. You see, it starts at birth. The relationship between a, a mother and her baby is a vital one. When the mother is, is nursing her baby or, or feeding her baby, she's actually developing that child. Modern neuroscience calls it the joy center. There's a part of our brain that's wired for joy. And it will only grow as a baby receives love from its, its mother in the first instance and then from, it, then from the father and, and, the, and then from others. And that's something that happens from infancy. The baby can't speak. The baby can barely see. But the, the baby can already understand love. Doesn't need a word for it. It's just something that's imparted. And that's the thing that neuroscience tells us, that, that in relationships, in healthy relationships, there's an energy transfer. Something is imparted. Now, it happens in bad relationships, too. Life can be sucked out of us by a bad relationship. But let's talk about positive relationships. We actually receive energy from somebody else. I don't understand how that works, but you all know it to be true. Isn't it, isn't it true that, that you get together with some good friends and you have an evening together? Something happens. And you get to the end of the evening and say, wow, that was awesome. See, that was energy. That changes us. And when we're in healthy relationships, that energy actually makes us grow. Our brains develop. Mordecai knew that without brain scans or any modern neuroscience. But... I'm so glad that neuroscience simply confirms what the Bible has been teaching us all these years, all these millennia. We need healthy relationships. We grow through healthy relationships just as much as we grow through food and oxygen. So if we want to thrive in this life, then the quality of our relationships is directly proportional. Okay, so let's talk about Esther. Esther. First scripture from the book of Esther, a little bit of background. Sorry, too quick. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. That's just a little snippet that tells us a little about the relationship between Mordecai and Esther. Oh, by the way, there was no such thing as teenagers in those days. That's a modern invention. So Esther obeyed Mordecai when she was brought up by him. And so she continued to do it when she left home and, and went into the, the king's palace. So Mordecai was her stepfather, if you like. So we know what happened, that, that um, the king Ahasuerus 
um, had a big party and a lot of alcohol involved. And it was a male-only show, as those feasts were. And, um, of course, once they had a little bit too much alcohol, things got a little out of hand. And the king wanted to bring in his beautiful wife, Vashti, to show her off. So Vashti was summoned to appear before all these drunken men. She was smart enough to refuse. And unfortunately, in that culture, that meant that she needed to be got rid of. Because what would happen if other women got the idea that they could refuse to do what their husbands commanded? Hmm, aren't you glad you don't live in that culture? Or maybe you wish you were. No, please don't. <laughs> anyway. So Vashti's gone, the king needs a new queen, so they have this sort of beauty pageant and gather up all the beautiful women that they can find, including Esther. And obviously, all we know of Esther at this stage is, is that she's a beautiful young woman. Okay, so let's fast forward a bit into the story and see what happened, because the king obviously had to approve of these women and decide which one was going to be queen. So here we go. When the turn came for Esther... Yes, let's skip over the genealogy bit. When the, next verse. Um, to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Next verse. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. That tells us something about the, the character of Esther, doesn't it? That, that she was a person that people liked. You know, people wanted to to honor her and respect her. And so Esther was taken to the king in the 10th month. Yeah, we can skip that bit. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So that's how this, this young Jewish woman became the queen of Persia, and um, now we're ready for the, the unhappy bit to happen, because like all good stories, there has to be a villain, and the villain is a man named Haman, and Haman is, is, is a high-level official in the, in the country, and um, Mordecai refuses to worship him because he only worships God. Anyway, Haman decides that he hates Mordecai, and not only Mordecai, he wants to get rid of all Jewish people because they're all trouble. So Haman persuades the king that this would be a good idea to send out a, a decree around the whole empire to exterminate the Jews. So Mordecai hears about this and he's not happy about it, um, not just because it means he's going to die, but because all his people are going to die. And, and so he realizes that Esther is the only person who can um, inject some sanity into the conversation. So what does he do? He can't go into the palace, but he can at least send messages. And, and so the most famous verses from the book of Esther that most of us will be familiar with are these. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. See, here's the thing about quality relationships. In a, in a quality relationship, we give permission to somebody to speak into our life. And sometimes it's a word of correction. Sometimes it's something that we don't want to do. But because of the nature of the relationship, we, we accept that what they're saying is good. Now, here's the secret. A quality relationship is one where we know that somebody is not just with us, but they're for us. They're not just with us, 
They're for us. And so when they bring something to us, they're doing it for our benefit. And we have that with the courageous friends who can confront us about something in our life that needs to be dealt with. They can see faults or weaknesses in us that, that are stopping us from moving forward in God. And they have the courage to speak to us about it. And we, because of the relationship, can accept it. That's how we grow. Because people bring those kind of, of positive words that will help us move to a, the next stage of our development. And so Mordecai brings this challenging word to Esther. Why is it challenging? Because Esther has to risk her life. Because to go before the king without the king asking for you to come risks the king um, saying, you're dead. How dare you come into my presence without me wanting you to come? And so Esther knows the price of, of doing what Mordecai says. So what does she do? She does it. She goes to the king. And you know, you know how the story evolves. There's a few complications and things along the way. But basically, everything gets reversed. And, and Haman, who intended to hang Mordecai on a big, a big gallows, ends up being hanged himself on the same gallows. And Haman's gone. The bad guy's gone. But we also see Esther now developing confidence as a woman, developing confidence as the queen. She now goes to the king a second time. She has the courage now to, to do that. And this time, she's, she's asking that, that, that the Jews should be spared and also that, that the Jews be, be permitted to have an annual feast to celebrate this, this remarkable state of affairs. She pleads for for the life of her own people. And the king grants that. And the Jewish people are spared. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a Jesus. He could never have been born if there were no Jewish people. So God's hand is at work behind the scenes, doing things that she had no idea of. And Esther, then we see a little later in the story, she herself sends out a decree across the whole empire instructing the Jews that they are to remember these events, remember what happened, and to celebrate every year. The Feast of Purim is something that Jewish people still celebrate to this day. So we see how Esther has grown into this, this wonderful woman of God. She had the potential all along, but without Mordecai, would she have ever got there? And that's the challenge for us, we need that kind of uh, voice in, in our life to, to help us grow. Think about it. Think about some of the people in your life who've, who've been able to sort of help you see things that you couldn't see yourself. Look, we all have thoughts. We all have things that are going on in our head about what we're going to do. But how are we going to get new thoughts? You know, if we keep think thinking the same old thoughts, we're going to be the same old people that we always were. How do we grow? We need fresh thoughts. And often it's the, the people close to us who have the ability to see things or to say something that triggers something that changes our whole life. You experience that? I look back on my own life. I didn't have the imagination. Gosh, I spent most of my life being an accountant. We don't even have a personality. Well, that's not quite true. But I, d I didn't have the imagination to, to do a lot of the things that, and someone would say to me, John, why don't you do this? John, have you ever thought about this? And I would never have done it without them. And, and then I look back and say, wow, thank you, God, for giving the person courage to say that to me. We need those kind of relationships. That's how we grow. And, of course, it works both ways. Isn't that what a healthy marriage should be like? I consider myself extremely blessed. I have a wife who loves me. She actually likes me. 
She encourages me. She, you know, she's, she's always there for me. She was here at the early service this morning because she wanted to support me. You know, she's, she's always there for me. That is such a blessing. The New Zealand culture is not an affirming culture. If we see somebody um, rising a little too fast, we think it's our job to cut them down. It's called the tall poppy syndrome. You don't want somebody to do too well because otherwise they'll get a swollen head. And then they'll be, have the sin of pride. You know, we've got to deal with that. You know, no one's allowed to ex excel or, or do anything. So I celebrate um, America because my wife is American. So she's not infected with that disease. She, <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm set free from the bondage of my own culture. And, and now I can enjoy American culture. So thank you, America, for being that kind of culture. And we need that. We need, the, we need people in our lives to... To affirm us. Amen. So notice how the book of Esther ends. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus. And he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. That's the last verse of the book. And it tells us a lot about the kind of person Mordecai was. He just didn't care about himself. He cared about others. And people saw that. And they respected him for that. That's why I like Mordecai. He's one of the unsung heroes of, of the Old Testament. He just did. He just did what God created him to do. He was that kind of person. So how does that speak to us? Two ways. We need Mordecai's in our life, don't we? The kind of person that's going to, is going to affirm you. The kind of person who's for you. Who actually believes in you. Who actually sees what you can do. What you can become. That's not pride. That's just being the person that God created you to be. And many times it's, it's through other people that that release comes. I respect Ryan Burns a lot because he's that kind of person. You are so blessed to have him as, as a pastor because he's, he sees people, the good in people. He, he applauds them. He celebrates them. He encourages them. That's the kind of person that we need to, to lead us. We need Mordecai's in our life. But the bigger issue is we also need to be Mordecai's. All of us, every one of us in this room, we need to be listened to. We need to be understood, and we need to be valued. Listened to, understood, and valued. If we're not valued, then what's the point of living? If, if we have no value in this world, then why exist? And we need to see the value in the people that God's put in our lives. My wife, Sonia, is way better at it than I am. Just listening to people is, is such a difficult thing to do. Because sometimes it's like a, a tennis game. You know, like, like they say something and we, we just want to jump in and, and say something back. Can't wait for them to stop talking so that we can start talking. That's not listening listening to somebody, listening to what they're really saying. There's the challenge. Those are relational skills that we, we desperately need. Look at what's happened in 
in the last year and a bit since COVID came on the scene. Social distancing, that's a curse. I understand physical distancing, but social distancing is, is like stopping us from having those kinds of relationships. We've got to fight that. I'm not saying we're, we're fighting against the, the, the battle to eradicate COVID. I'm just saying that we need to be aware of, of what's at stake here. I think especially of school children, the ones who haven't been able to go to school for a year because schools are being closed. I mean, kids need to learn how to do relationships with their peers. They need to be around other kids. To be stuck at home is torture. We're going to be paying a price for a long time of the psychological damage that, that has happened in, in the last year. I'm not going on a political rant here. That's, that's, just, that's just the way things are. I've got grandkids. I see how hard it is for them when they're stuck at home and, and they're not allowed out. Okay, understand the reasons, but see the cost. See the human cost. We need that kind of interaction. I'm so glad we're, we're able to worship again in, in our churches because this kind of interaction is vital. We cannot thrive without good relationships. That's the simple deal. So there's a challenge for me and a challenge for you. Think about it this week. Think about the people who've been Mordecai's in your life and thank them. Thank them. How do they know what you mean to them if you don't tell them? We need to tell people, thank you for doing that. Thank you for correcting me when, when you said that. Thank you for being my friend, even when I goofed up. But then we need to ask ourselves, who can I be a Mordecai to? Am I being a Mordecai to my spouse? Am I valuing her? Am I encouraging her? Because I want to see her grow into the woman that God designed her to be. I want her to achieve everything that, that God intended for her. And he's put me in her life to facilitate that. My kids, my grandkids. There's the challenge of Mordecai. Or if you like, it's the Mordecai factor. We need the Mordecai factor in our relationships, and we need to be aware of what's going on and what's at stake. That if we want to thrive, we need healthy relationships. And thank God that he loves us so completely that he puts people in our lives to help us develop and grow. So let's celebrate that this morning and, and thank him for his goodness. So Father, thank you that you love each one of us, that you want each one of us to thrive and become the people that you designed us to be. Thank you for the people that you've put in our lives. May we be the same to them as they are to us. Yes, may we be men and women of faith, building a culture of faith in this broken world. May Jesus be glorified in our midst. Amen.